Fibromyalgia is a poorly understood and often underdiagnosed medical condition. In fact, it's estimated that up to 5% of people suffer from fibromyalgia. In this video, I'm going to share what's known about fibromyalgia and its moving parts. Secondly, I explain two underlying causes that I commonly see in my clinic from a Chinese medicine perspective and how I treat them. Then, at the end of this video, I'm going to share four lifestyle steps that can benefit people with fibromyalgia. So what is fibromyalgia? Fibro, meaning fibrous tissue, my, meaning muscle, and algia, meaning pain. Since its discovery, fibromyalgia has been a controversial medical condition. That's because there aren't any lab tests that point to a clear diagnosis. And this has caused skepticism from some doctors. However, a scoring system has been developed, making it much easier to confirm fibromyalgia. That is, if a patient fulfills the following criteria, fibromyalgia is what they have. That is, unless other medical conditions can explain all of their symptoms. So, fibromyalgia is characterized by widespread pain and tenderness in muscles and joints for more than three months. Also, the patient must have sensitivity and experience pain in 11 of 18 sensitive areas when palpated during a physical examination. And along with such widespread pain, other symptoms include fatigue, trouble sleeping, poor memory and concentration, and sometimes irritable bowel and irritable bladder. Now these are the key characteristics, however it's important to know that fibromyalgia is a spectrum condition. This means that some people have mild symptoms while others have high levels of pain and flare-ups. Outside of this criteria, checking blood glucose, hormones, vitamin D, thyroid function, inflammatory markers are all important because problems with blood glucose, hormones, vitamin D, thyroid function, inflammatory markers can lead to similar symptoms. The good news is that there's many new insights into fibromyalgia. Much more is known today than what was known 10 years ago. Interestingly, the discoveries I'm about to share with you also align with the two underlying causes that I commonly see in my clinic from a Chinese medicine perspective, which I talk about later on in this video. The first new insight into fibromyalgia is something called small fiber peripheral neuropathy. Now it's been known for a long time that x-rays, MRI scans and other imaging that look at structural issues often find nothing wrong in patients with fibromyalgia, meaning that their joints and muscles appear like they're perfectly fine. However, new findings show up to 50% of people with fibromyalgia have something called small fiber peripheral neuropathy. This basically means that the nerves have become dysfunctional, are degenerating or even slowly dying in a large number of people with fibromyalgia. Now you may have heard about peripheral neuropathy in patients with diabetes. This is where the feet can be easily affected. However, this is different in patients with fibromyalgia. Firstly, it's less to do with blood sugars or insulin resistance. And secondly, the problem isn't just in their feet, it's all over their body. For example, researchers have taken biopsies of tissue with an electron microscope that's 100,000 times more powerful than a human eye. Such imaging has shown that the diameter of nerve fibers in people with fibromyalgia were up to 10 times smaller than people with small fiber neuropathy that don't have fibromyalgia. So what it seems from this imaging is that the entire body seems to be losing small nerve fibers. And when these small nerve fibers become dysfunctional, they cause pain. Other studies have also looked at pain receptors and how they're functioning. Some have shown that up to 76% of fibromyalgia patients display abnormal pain receptor nerve fiber functioning. Another new insight into fibromyalgia is something called central sensitization. So it's shown that a large percentage of patients with fibromyalgia have central sensitization. This is where the brain fails to drown out some of the pain signals coming back from the body. Basically, it's an alteration in the central nervous system that leads to an increase in pain and other perceptions. These include being more sensitive to pain, light, sound, food, and even medication. 
We all have pain fibers sending signals to our brain. However, it's estimated only 25% of these signals get to the brain for most of us to realize something is painful. However, in a patient with fibromyalgia, a hug can be painful. And studies have demonstrated this by applying a painful stimulus to a subject's finger. For example, upon stimulation, larger portions of the brain light up, including areas that control emotions for the patients that have fibromyalgia compared to the patients that don't. The good news is that you can test for small fiber peripheral neuropathy. This can be done by something called intraepidermal nerve fiber density testing, which can show if small fibers are not working well or have reduced numbers or even appear abnormal. Another test that can point to small fiber peripheral neuropathy is called corneal confocal bill microscopy. This tests nerve fiber density in the cornea of the eye. Research has shown that corneal thickness relative to nerve fiber thickness is significantly smaller in people with fibromyalgia. So we've spoken about two new insights into fibromyalgia, but in the next part of this video, I'd like to share two underlying causes that I see in my clinic from a Chinese medicine perspective. In fact, these underlying issues are so common in patients with fibromyalgia that I categorize fibromyalgia into two types. The first type is called blood stasis. Blood stasis is the inefficient supply of blood, oxygen, and nutrient flow into major muscle groups and motor nerves. Now, why is blood stasis a problem? This is because when large muscle groups and their associated motor nerves don't receive enough blood, oxygen, or nutrient, it forces motor nerves to contract their associated muscle groups. This leads to muscle tightness and pain throughout their entire body. And it's not hard to imagine how a restriction of essential resources carried via the blood into small vessels and nerves could contribute to problems such as small fiber peripheral neuropathy. So in order to treat blood stasis, a correct diagnosis has to be made. One important tool to do this is the palpation of the radial artery, also known as pulse diagnosis. This is used to measure the health of the vascular system in Chinese medicine. And speaking of pulse diagnosis, there are two common presentations that appear in the pulse with someone with blood stasis. When palpating the radial artery, it'll feel like I'm putting my finger on a bunch of mud. The radial pulse is undefined and it will be difficult to distinguish any normal shape. These patients are exhausted, they can't sleep, they experience anxiousness and digestive complaints seen in irritable bowel syndrome. The second type of pulse presentation is a very thin constricted radial artery as if I'm putting my finger on a tight thin wire. This is more common in thinner patients. These patients are particularly distressed, they find it difficult to relax and often think of worst case scenarios. They're running on a fight or flight response. Over time I've noticed that it's common for these people to have been exposed to mental or physical traumas as a child. The other possibility is those that work a lot and don't get time for rest. These patients have excess stress hormone pumping through their body which can amplify their level of pain. This excess stress can also explain why the patient's pulse is so thin and tight. This is because when a lot of adrenaline is pumping through the body, it can vasoconstrict blood vessels. Both of these types of blood stasis can come with cold hands and feet, indicating poor blood flow to the extremities. They bruise easily, they can't sleep, and they're tired all the time. All of these symptoms can be explained by blood stasis. That is, if blood, oxygen, and nutrient flow is restricted to nerves and tissues, it's no wonder why they have a difficult time generating energy, have cold hands and feet, are in chronic pain, and bruise easily. So you might be wondering, how do we treat blood stasis? Both types of blood stasis require a different treatment approach in order to encourage blood flow into motor nerves and all the way down to the small capillaries of the skin. In the patient with blood stasis, carrying excess body fat, they require a class of Chinese medicines called blood movers to strongly increase blood flow. Whereas the thinner patients with a very thin, tight radial artery, accompanied with 
distress require blood movers that have the ability to expand blood vessels to encourage blood flow into targeted areas and Chinese medicines to treat kidney insufficiency and or adrenal fatigue can also be useful. So the second most common underlying cause I see in my clinic from a Chinese medicine perspective is blood stasis plus trapped heat. Now trapped heat may not be a term you're familiar with, however it's just a descriptive word to describe underlying problems similar to inflammation. For example, when a joint is red, swollen and warm, the Chinese associate these signs with heat. Patients with trapped heat get easily frustrated, have a short temper, mood changes, restless sleep and feel tired all the time. When palpating the radial artery, there will be a strong amplitude in the deeper layers of the artery up to halfway down the arm. Because blood stasis is involved, the radial artery will actually still feel undefined, meaning that the shape will be hard to distinguish. However, that pounding quality to the pulse will be there. This can also indicate potential autoimmune issues. In this scenario, blood movers are prescribed in combination with a class of Chinese medicines that clear heat. These are designed to increase blood flow as well as shrink swollen tissues and reduce inflammation. Now on the topic of Chinese medicines, it's important to understand that Chinese medicines are not prescribed based on symptoms but underlying problems. Many symptoms can be caused by different problems so it's vital to receive a correct diagnosis to ensure a really good response. So another strategy that we can use in Chinese medicine is something called acupuncture. So you might be wondering how can acupuncture help? Well the ancient Chinese knew that acupuncture had a positive effect on blood, vital air and nutrient flow through the blood vessels and even small tiny vessels. Acupuncture is a useful tool to encourage blood circulation and the resources carried via the blood into areas of disease so they can heal properly. However, what the ancient Chinese didn't know was that acupuncture achieves this by first stimulating the release of the body's own pain relief. That is, acupuncture stimulates nerves that send signals to the brainstem. These signals stimulate the release of the body's endogenous opioids such as enkephalins, endorphins, endomorphins, dynorphins, as well as non-opioid neuropeptides such as substance P, vasoactive intestinal peptide, and calcitonin gene-related peptide. The result of the release of these endogenous opioids and non-opioid neuropeptides is a reduction in pain and the widening of blood vessels to allow blood, oxygen, and nutrient delivery into organs and muscle tissues. For example, when in pain, our body has a tendency to restrict blood flow and tighten muscles around the areas of pain to protect itself. However, as the pain drops during acupuncture, the body starts to relax blood vessels and its surrounding muscle tissues. The outcome is a fresh delivery of blood, oxygen and nutrient flow into damaged areas. Now this is vital because without adequate blood flow, the body will have a hard time fixing itself. This is one of the reasons why Chinese medicine is so focused on blood, oxygen and nutrient flow. So we just covered two common underlying causes that I see in my clinic from a Chinese medicine perspective. However, now I'm going to share four lifestyle steps that can support these underlying problems. So the first lifestyle step that patients with fibromyalgia can take is to reduce body fat. Why? Because excess body fat puts extra pressure on blood vessels and microvessels to the point where they become squished. This makes it even harder for blood to flow into major muscle groups and motor nerves. Now this is important because reducing body fat takes pressure off blood vessels and allow for more efficient blood flow. And this brings me to an important function of Chinese herbal medicines called blood movers in such patients. Now sometimes patients that are very tired and are in pain will have a difficult time losing weight. But by using blood movers, we can help circulate blood, oxygen and nutrient into targeted areas. This greatly increases their chances of following a dietary guide because it brings some vitality back. This brings me to the second lifestyle step, which is nutrition. First, it's important to understand that everyone is different and may require their own 
dietary plan. However, these are suggestions that I've found to be useful in patients with fibromyalgia. Firstly, removing inflammatory foods such as processed sugars, processed flours, processed chemicals, as well as foods containing gluten. Instead, focusing on a whole food diet, organic where possible, including healthy proteins, healthy fats, and plenty of fresh vegetables. Now, you might be wondering, why no gluten? This is because research has shown that gluten in patients without gluten intolerance, for example, non-celiac gluten sensitivity, can create autoimmune reactions in the gut. This can lead to many symptoms seen in fibromyalgia, such as brain fog, fatigue, peripheral neuropathy, and more. One study even showed that 20 patients with fibromyalgia were put on a gluten-free diet and all had improvement in their symptoms. I have also seen the same benefits in my clinic. So the third lifestyle step that can support patients with fibromyalgia is moderate exercise. Moderate exercise is useful because it encourages blood, oxygen and nutrient flow through the vascular system. This may help the patient feel better mentally and physically. However, I caution on ultra or long distance exercise as it can create the opposite effect. Generally, exercise such as walking, yoga, qigong and stretching are much more suited to people with fibromyalgia. Basically, anything that's gentle and supports healthy blood flow. So, the fourth lifestyle step that patients can take with fibromyalgia is dealing with distress. Why? Because researchers have shown links between people with fibromyalgia and patients who have experienced childhood trauma. The theory is that the brain isn't mature enough in children to protect their frontal lobe from external stresses. This has been linked with fibromyalgia because high levels of stress hormone may lead to a higher sensitivity to pain. Also, if distress is affecting the patient's sleep, patients may not make chemicals in the right balance. This could predispose them to pain and the brainstem not filtering out pain properly. Also, stress hormones released during distress have also shown to affect pain fiber nerve endings. More specifically, high levels of cortisol can lead to a high sensitivity to pain. Short term, obviously the stress response is very beneficial to us. For example, the brain sends out stress hormone to generate blood sugar for energy, release adrenaline and increase blood pressure. We become stronger, can run faster, fight better, and our senses are more acute. However, left for too long, these responses can damage our body. For instance, too much stress hormone for too long can reduce blood supply all over our body. One example is to the gut. This may lead to a decreased vagal response that controls bowel movement, affect how our stomach makes acid and more. With reduced stomach acid, we can't kill bacteria and viruses as efficiently. And too much stress hormone can also attack our gut lining resulting in a leaky gut food sensitivities, and more. So, my top three ways to deal with distress are acupuncture, Chinese herbal medicine, and also something called the Demartini method, which can help resolve anxieties, depressions, resentments, griefs, and any stresses that pop up in our life. So, thanks for listening, guys. If you have a question regarding anything in this video, please leave a question in the comment section below. And if you like this video, give me a big thumbs up and subscribe to my channel if you'd like to receive more content just like this. Be grateful and take care.